All right. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving weekend. I love Thanksgiving a lot. I didn't preach on it this year. Oftentimes I do preach just in general. Uh, it's one of my favorite th uh, holidays just with the, the spirit of, of thankfulness. is something that's taught uh, very much in Scripture, just being thankful for things, being content with what you have, praising the Lord for His goodness and for all that He's blessed you with. is a great day to just set aside in, in remembrance and being thankful thankful, thankful for your loved ones, thankful for how God bless you in, in, in many different capacities. And what's, what's interesting, though, is how quickly American culture can go from being thankful to just becoming extremely covetous. And it's this, uh, the, the Christmas holiday, where you're supposed to have what, what I would consider to be the spirit of Christmas is one of, of love and giving and uh, uh, just patience, goodness, you know, all, all the things that you could associate with walking in the spirit of God, celebrating the birth of Christ, uh, celebrating our Savior, you know, things that are all good, wholesome things have kind of been turned on their heads when it comes to how the world will take something good and try to, to turn it and make it the exact opposite. And the, the title of my sermon this morning is The Spirit of Covetousness. The Spirit of Covetousness. And this is something that we have to deal with. And every single person is susceptible to falling into the trap of covetousness, of desiring something that you either can't have, you shouldn't have, something that's not available to you. And we started off in Exodus chapter 20 this morning because this is a famous passage on the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments, of course, is thou shalt not covet. If you look down in verse number 17, the Bible reads, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So what is this teaching us? that you shouldn't be looking on other people's stuff, other people's family, other pe you know, people in someone else's family, whether it be their wife going, oh man, I wish I had his wife, or looking at their house going, oh man, I wish I had his house, looking at his stuff, oh man, I wish I had his stuff, I wish I had his yard, I wish I had his car, I wish I had whatever he has. Look, that is covetousness and that is a sin. And this time of year, probably more than any other time of year, now this is, we're, we get pumped with this all the time, is a time of year where people are going to try to tell you why you need all kinds of various material items and material goods and material things, and they're going to be throwing things in your face to spend your money, to spend your money, to spend your money. Oh, it's Christmas time. Spend your money. It's Christmas time. Spend your money. It's Christmas time. You need this and this and this. Oh, man, let me get, I want to get this, and I want to have that, and I want to have that. Now, look, when we talk about covetousness, we need to understand that there's a difference between desiring something that you can easily go out, pull out your wallet, pay for, and it's yours. And there's nothing sinful about looking at something and be like, hey, you know what? I'd like to have that. And you're able to buy it. You can pay for it. No problem. No problem, right? The problem comes in, for example, in, in that example, in that scenario, would be when you're looking at something and you just simply can't afford it. You don't have the means to, to receive whatever it is that you're setting your eyes upon. And when you start setting your eyes and desiring things that's just out, of, just out of your range, can't do it, that's when it starts to become covetousness. And you start looking on things or lusting after things that you want to have, but you don't have. And this is why I don't recommend, you know, there is tons of TV shows. I don't recommend watching TV in general, but there are, you know, the, is that, I don't know if those shows, see, these, all these old shows always come to mind, and I have no idea if they still air or not, but that, that show Cribs, right, where people go through and they just kind of show off these, these multimillionaires, these rock stars and, and athletes and whoever, right, they go to these guys' houses and, and they show off their, their fancy house and, 
fancy cars and, and all this stuff. And people sit back and be like, oh man, I wish I had that house or I wish, I look, literally, this is what the Bible's saying in Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. You shouldn't be desiring to have your neighbor's house. You say, oh, I don't see what the big deal is in that. You don't have to even understand the big deal. You just have to recognize God said not to do it. Yeah, now look, there is a reason and there is a big deal for this and there is more to having a covetous heart that you need to be on guard about. But if you just are sitting here today going, I don't even see what's the problem with that. Why is that even a sin? Well, hopefully I can help explain that to you today. But if you never understand why, at least look at what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments in verse 17, and, and I don't see how you can explain otherwise, whether you think it should be a law or not, that that is not a sin to say, oh, I wish I had my neighbor's house, when it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. I mean, th this is pretty straightforward and simple to understand, and and as the Bible usually is. Very straightforward and easy to understand when it just comes to God's law, God's rules. It's pretty black and white. It just says, hey, look, don't do this. We always want to, as human beings, as sinful human beings, want to justify our flesh and want to minimize or downplay how bad things really are. Uh, it's, it's a natural thing. The natural man doesn't want to hear that he's wrong, that he's bad, that he's sinful, right? The natural man, our flesh is bad. Our flesh is wicked. Our flesh can do anything right. But thank God he gives us his spirit, right? For all of us who are born again, you got the spirit of, of Christ within you, which helps us to be able to be pleasing unto the Lord and to walk in the spirit and do things that are good and righteous and holy. But covetousness, look, we need to, and we're going to go in depth in this. And turn, if you would, to um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs twenty-one. Covetousness, really, and especially if you think that it's really not that big of a deal, like what I'm, what I was just saying. Besides being in the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and and if you'd like to, you could also turn to First Corinthians chapter five. If you're not already familiar with this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the latter portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, lists off various sins that for people who are born again, for people who are called a brother, if a person is guilty of one of these sins, the Bible says that you ought to put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So there are certain sins that, that are so bad that... God is, is telling us, is instructing us in his holy word that if people are guilty of this, you need to put those people away from you essentially until they could repent, get right, and then they'll be welcome back in the fold, in the group. And if you don't, if you haven't read that, if you're not familiar with it, and we're just going to look at verse number 11 in 1 Corinthians 5, he has mentioned how he's written in the past not to keep company with fornicators and all different types of people. But he's saying, I, I didn't mean that like for just everyone out in the world. Because then you would just not be able to talk to anyone because that's how the world is. The world is full of people who are involved in, in, in these types of sins. But he clarifies in verse 11, he says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company right? Not to hang out with, not to fellowship with, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother. Now this isn't talk, he's not talking about your physical, just flesh and blood brother. This is applicable to the church. This is applicable to born again believers, someone who's called a brother, be a fornicator. So be involved in fornication. Again, this world's going to tell you fornication, no big deal, right? It used to not be that way in our culture, but these days, being a fornicator, no big deal. But what does the Bible say? Hey, if someone's a brother, you know, put away from among yourselves that person. Or the second one, covetous. Someone's a covetous person. Now, and it says, or an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, or an extortioner. I'm not going to go through all this list. With such an one, no, not to 
eat don't even go grab a bite with them don't go have lunch with them put away from among yourselves that wicked person the Bible says later and now when we look at covetous a covetous person is is it becomes more evident as part of characterizing that person right everyone can be guilty of some covetousness at some point in their life there's something that you look at and be like you desire to have it and you say well that's covetousness and then you know most people or a lot of Christians could just get over that and be like man I shouldn't be looking at that that's wrong and kind of move on right that's not what this verse is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 5 it's talking about the people who are continually just being covetous and desiring other people's stuff and desiring things that they can't have and you know just just it be, because covetousness becomes consuming and that's how you'll notice well who's really guilty of this well because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh so when people are just always talking about things that they don't have things that they want to have oh i mean i one day I'm going to have this. If I ever win the lottery, I'm going to get this and all these other things. You're just kind of having this mindset on all the stuff that you don't have now, that you can't have now, that God hasn't blessed you with now, and just focusing on that. That's covetousness. That's covetousness. Proverbs 21, the Bible says in verse number 25, The desire of the slothful killeth him. The desire. That's just what he wants. And then who's a slothful? A slothful is someone who's lazy. But just having this desire, but he's too lazy to do anything about it, he says that desire is going to kill him. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Be like, oh, I really want that, but I don't want to work. Oh, I really wish I could have that, but I don't really want to work for it. I just want to have that. Well, Someone who's not willing to work for something that they want to have is a covetous person. Amen. I want to have that, but I don't want to go out and work for that. And that desire is going to kill him. Because you either got to be willing to work and say, like, fine, okay, I want to have something. Well, I'm going to work for it. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. You want to set your sight on something? You want to buy a house? Well, you know what? I need to have a certain amount of money. I'm going to work, and I'm going to, I'm going to earn, and I'm going to work for that and then buy it oh there's a certain man or a certain woman that I'm looking after I'm single they're single I want to marry that person okay well there's no reason why you can't marry that person right they're born again and and you want to marry that person well you might have to work for them like like uh, Jacob did right I work for it for that you know and that's fine but the person who doesn't want to work doesn't want to do anything just oh I just want to have it now you're getting into covetous uh, territory. Verse number 26 there says, He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. And notice the, the, how much diametrically opposed these two concepts are because the, the, righteous, the righteous attitude, the righteous are the ones that are liberal, and I don't mean liberal in the political sense. Liberal is the sense of free, and generous and giving and willing to help and, and open in that regard, right? Just, yeah, sure, right? They're, they're not focused on all the monetary things, the physical things. It's kind of like, yeah, I got this here. I'll help you out. Sure, why not, right? And, and who cares? Because if your heart's not on the physical things of this world, it's not on the money, it's like, so what? Yeah, sure, I could give you some of that because I don't really care that much about it. Just like w w when we read about the new Jerusalem, when there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem comes down, the streets are paved with gold. And they're like, oh man, gold, that sounds awesome. Yeah, but that shows how much God cares about it because we're going to be treading gold under our feet. Amen. We're just going to be walking on it. And sure, it looks nice. It's going to look nice. But that's not, the, you know, that's not what's exalted. That is what is abased Amen. in God's world, in God's city. It's the lowest. Yeah, it's gold. So what? And that is how we ought to be viewing 
the monetary riches and stuff and just say, so what? It's here today, gone tomorrow. Who cares? It's all going to burn up anyways. So when you have your heart set right on the things of this world, it's going to help prevent you from even getting covetous, at least over the physical things, right? And look, covetousness could be broad. It, it could encompass a lot more than just a physical object, but that is a very common sin is people just wanting to have, oh, I want to have that new phone or car or what, whatever, right? Insert object here, right? That, that whatever, whatever that thing is that, that you're just so, have your, your, your eyes focused on. And like I said, if you can't afford it, if you can't get it, then don't be wrapped up in that because now that's, that's where it turns into covetousness. And it's just like someone seeking a spouse. Hey, look, if you're already married, now you're being covetous. You already have a spouse. Don't be seeking another spouse. You're not married. You look at someone else's spouse. You're covetous because you can't have that person. So don't be thinking on another person like that. You seek what is available to you. Turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to see some of the, call it the fakeness of covetousness as well. It's really vanity. It's vain. There's really no substance to a person who is covetous. Because just covetousness itself and just getting sucked into that lust of always wanting to have things, it's, it's fake. It, it leads people to, be, to live more fake lives. And we'll see that from Scripture. And it's hollow and empty. And as we'll see in just a minute, you know, once you, 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 get, you actually get something that you've been wanting and coveting for so long, it never satisfies the way that people who are covetous built it up. Oh man, I just, if I could just have this one thing, it's like, then you finally get it and it's like, it's great for a day. And then, and then, and then you move on to the next thing. Because when you look on things to give you satisfaction and, 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 and joy or whatever it is that you're seeking out of that thing, you're not going to find it. Because we shouldn't, we're, you're not going to find thing, uh, joy in things. That's not what brings joy. Just like the Bible says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Helping people, serving people, ministering to people, that brings joy. Yeah. That brings real joy and comfort and peace and walking in the Spirit, being a servant, just as Jesus taught us. That will bring you the, 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 the peace that you're looking for but some extra thing, some extra toy, uh, you know, an adult toys, kid toys, whatever, whether it's, you know, getting your sea do or getting your boat or getting your, you know, whatever, big truck. Yeah, ah, it's cool. Okay, it's great. But then at the end of the day, it, it becomes, oh, man, I got to I got to do I got to change the brakes. I, you know, it becomes a headache. I got to maintain it. I got to do this. I got to spend more money on it now. And it's like, well, uh, it was great when you didn't have it. It's awesome. Now you got it, and now it's another story, right? And it just turns into emptiness. It's kind of a, a, a more of a, of a drain than it is a blessing. Oftentimes these things, and that's part of the deceitfulness of being covetous or, or you know, allowing yourself to get wrapped up in stuff and put inordinate affection on things because they're, they're not going to satisfy. Look at verse number 30 in Ezekiel 33. The Bible says this, Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another, everyone to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. So this is a fake people. It says in verse 30, I was saying there, 
They're talking against you in their houses, by the walls, out. They're, they're out there talking against you, but then they say, oh, hey, let's go hear the word of the Lord. And then they show up like God's people should. They come to church. They hear what the man of God has to say, and they'll hear the words. They'll sit there and they'll listen, but they're not going to do them. Why? Because with their mouth, oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, what a wonderful sermon. Oh, we love the word of the Lord. That's what they say with their mouth, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. They don't internalize the word of God. They don't actually care to put God's word into practice. It's just, no, my heart's already fixed somewhere else. I'll hear what you have to say, but my heart's still just over here in my covetousness. It's fake. It's a fake religion. It's a fake Christianity. For those that want to just come in and be like, oh yeah, I'm going to pretend to hear the word of God, but then I'm going to do nothing about it. I'm not going to apply it. I'm not going to actually receive it. I'm still just going to go after my covetousness. When I walk out of here today, I'm getting ready for my Cyber Monday deals tomorrow, and I don't care how much debt I need to get into in order to get the things that I want, but I'm going to get those things. And look, if you buy a deal tomorrow, I'm not saying that you're a wicked person, but... <laughs> Don't be covetous, right? Don't be covetous. That's the whole point. It's not that you can't spend money you have, but don't be covetous over things. And don't get caught up into it too because a lot of people will, will destroy themselves financially over covetousness and really dig holes and debts for themselves that make it extremely difficult to get out of and will cause your own pain and suffering in this life, just financially speaking, because you've allowed yourself to get covetousness covetous and, and, and want things that you really can't afford and that's what the the media the world the TV shows all the things out are gonna put all of this standard of living in front of your face and be like I need to have the cars and the house and the phones and the computers and the gadgets and the you know whatever and all this stuff right and they'll, they'll pitch it to you as just being this is so awesome. You need to have this now. I mean, how often do they do that? I, I watch these stupid releases every once in a while. I'll catch them for like Apple products or other products. And they're just like, this is the best. You know, and they, they pump it up and they've got the lights and the sound. And it's just like the smoke's going off. And this is cool. It's like the camera's a little better. <laughs> it's like a little faster and you won't ever know the difference. Like there's, there's all these stupid details, but they're going to, they're going to make, oh, oh, I got to get, I got to get that phone, man. I need to get it. You didn't even pay off your other one. I don't care. I need to get this one. It's the best thing. I need to have it. And, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people too, they look at it as a status thing. How shallow are you? If you need an object to show off to other people, to somehow think that that's going to make them like you or, or make yourself just inflate your pride or your ego. I mean, look, that is wicked. Who cares what stuff? You should not care about that at all. And you should definitely not be thinking about how can I inflate myself and show some status that I have by some wealth, especially when you don't have it. Right? It's, it's bad enough when you do have it. But how about now trying to, to pretend like you're something that you're not? Or you have things you don't have. And you're getting yourself into debt in order to put up this image. And you know, when it comes to debt, the Bible says that uh, the rich ruleth over the poor and the, borrow the borrower is servant to the lender. And when it comes to Christmas time, especially, I'm, I'm preaching on the spirit of covetousness. Oftentimes, well intentioned people that want to give will still go too far and get sucked into the commercialism that's being pitched to you and want to, or feel obligated even, to have to spend tons of money on people and buy these things. Be, well, it's Christmas. I have to. No, you don't. No, you don't. Here's what Christmas ought to be. And the spirit of Christmas ought to be. It should never be reduced to being some obligation of spending X amount of dollars. Never let Christmas get like that for you. You're gonna, you're, it's going to ruin the holiday for you. Now, 
Giving gifts is great. I love giving gifts. We give gifts as a family. Okay, but you know what? Different years are different gifts. Because some years we've been blessed more than other years. In some years we don't really have that much. But you know what I'm, I refuse to do? Is just go into debt in order to buy junk at the end of the day is what it is. All the toys and things for the kids. That's just going to end up getting thrown away anyways. Sometimes within a week. <laughs> You feel my pain on that one, right? <laughs> like, hey, we just bought that. <laughs> well, that's why you can't get attached to things. Because it happens so much. But, but seriously, don't feel like you just have to spend money. You know, you know what means a lot more? What ought to mean a lot to people? You know, you, you always hear, it's a thought that counts. It really does count. It really does. Because you can do things or give gifts to people, even just, you know, how about this? I, I personally, other, I wouldn't care if I never received any thing from a person. You know what I'd probably like even more is if someone just wrote down, like, like took the time to write something nice to me. And it's genuine and sincere, right? If I were to receive something like that, I'd be like, this is great. When, when y'all put that, that anniversary thing together for my 10 years of preaching, like, like that meant the world to me. Not that, you know, I appreciate the gifts, but you know what? The gifts were so far secondary to just the thought of putting something together and putting something on and, and, and showing appreciation. Like, like that's huge. That's profound. That's, that, that really makes me feel loved. And you know, this isn't about me, it's about you and Christmas, and if you want to really give people a good Christmas, then think about it that way. And all the kids are going, no, stop talking, stop talking. The gifts are way better. But seriously, seriously, it is better. Sometimes, and, and we've, you know, we've changed things over the years and do things different in our house, and sometimes we'll choose, you know what, let's, do, let's have an experience together as a family where we could, you know, give them something in that regard. We'll give them our time and go somewhere special and be able to just have time set aside. Don't get all wrapped up in things. And sometimes you can do things together that don't even cost a lot of money. And don't ever gauge how much you love someone or how much you owe in dollars when you're thinking about giving a gift. You give gifts to people because you love them. But you can only give what you can afford. Don't go into debt to give gifts. Now you're just bringing yourself into bondage and that's not going to do anyone any good. The heartfelt gifts are way more valuable than the store-bought gifts. But the, but the covetousness and the marketing and the commercials are going to try to tell you different. Don't be deceived by that stuff. Being covetous also brings about a lot of fighting. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 4. And, again, and on the subject of gifts, I don't have, I don't have the scri a scripture reference for this. At least not in my notes. Don't ever expect, and, and kids, listen up. Don't ever think that you're entitled to receive gifts just because it's your birthday or just because it's Christmas. Never go into a holiday where people normally give gifts expecting to receive something from someone. Never think that you are entitled to receive some gift. Don't allow yourself to get that attitude because that's when you start getting a spoiled brat type of an attitude. Look, kids as well as adults can have the same attitude, the same mindset. It, it's sad that we have adults that I think never really grow up past the point of having this entitlement attitude of thinking that the world just owes you all this stuff. 
and that you just deserve to have all this stuff. Well, it's Christmas. I deserve to have this stuff. No, you don't. No, you don't. I don't. You don't. We don't deserve to have the gift. If someone loves you, wants to give you a gift, praise God. Thank that person. Be thankful for what you receive, no matter what it is. Well, last year's model, Dad, I mean, come on. You know there's a newer one out, right? No, you be thankful for what you got. You're turning to James 4, but uh, I'll read for you from Romans 7 because this, this ties together. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. So I didn't know what sin was, except the law had to tell me when there's, because when there's, sin is a transgression of the law. So when you're breaking the law, you're sinning. I didn't know what sin was, except the law was there. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law in Exodus 20, where we started out, said thou shalt not covet. And the Bible there in Romans 7 is equating that covetousness to lust. Why do you bring that up? Because we're going to read in James chapter 4 and see how that applies perfectly. That a covetousness that you have is also known as a lust. James 4 verse 1, the Bible reads, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? So fightings, wars, these battles with people, you have these problems. Where do they come from? They come from your lusts. And they'll come from covetousness. Let's keep reading. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. God doesn't want you to have things that you're just going to have to consume upon your lusts. And he never promises to give you all of those things that you want to have to consume upon your lusts. And if you remember, I preached not that long ago on this subject where I brought the reference up to the children of Israel when they're asking for the meat and they had this lust after flesh. They're being fed with manna and God was saying, Look, you know, be content with what you have. But then at the end of the day, so you know what? Fine. I'm going to let you have the lust of your flesh. And then a whole bunch of people died. It's not worth it. Don't set your heart on. Don't ask to receive these things that you just want to consume upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy, enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Envy is covetousness. You're envying someone else's stuff. You want to have that. That's covetousness. And the, the spirit, not the spirit of God, but the spirit of man, right? The, the, the flesh is what is going to uh, cause you, it lusts to envy. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 30, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Being a covetous, a covetous person or an envious person is going to make you a miserable person because you won't be satisfied, because you're looking on things you don't have. And that, that is like... If you have a problem being angry and upset and depressed, stop looking at the things you don't have. Seriously. That's what makes you upset. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have this relationship. I don't have this thing. I don't have this money. I don't have this position. I don't have whatever. This is what gets people upset. This is what gets people down. Instead, if you start focusing on the things you do have, Amen. now you can be happy. I don't have that, but hey, I have this. And I have this, and I have this, and I have this. And if you're saved, I, I, I have eternal life, Amen. which is more precious than anything I can receive in this world. I have a risen Savior. You have people, if you come to this church, you have people that love you. 
can't speak for anyone else in, in your life, but you know what? Here, you have people that love you here. Look on the things that you do have, not the things that you don't have. The Bible says uh, in Ecclesiastes 5, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse number 10. The Bible reads, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. So if you love silver, the Bible is saying you're, you'll never be satisfied with that. You love money, you'll never have enough. If that's what you keep seeking after, that, if you have that type of a greed or covetous heart, you, it'll never, ever, 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 ever be enough. You think, oh, well, once I reach this amount, then I'll be great. No, it won't. No, it won't. Why? The next verse says, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And if, man, that is a true statement as the day is long. I continue to realize this. Just day after day after day. It doesn't matter what you have. There's always things that will suck that away. Remember I was talking about all oh, that new fancy car? Yeah, and then you've got a new transmission you've got to put into it. And then you've got, some, you know, you've got all these. And now the gas prices have just gone up. And now it's like I need to get another mortgage just to pay for fuel. Whatever, right? Like, like all these things that, that come up. Yeah, you think it sounds great, but then it's like, Everything else comes in to take that away, which is why you shouldn't be setting your heart on those things. And you're never going to be satisfied. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's a great gain to just be content. Content means you're satisfied. I'm good with what I have. I'm good with where I'm at. I'm good. I'm good with what God has blessed me with. Great. Looking on what you have and not on what you don't have. I'm going to be content. For we brought nothing into this world. And, and you know, here's a good mindset to have. We brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Anything that you have right now is more than what you started with. Amen. Everything you have. Because you started with a bare bottom. <laughs> That's it. That's what you had coming into this world. So, And, and if you think about it that way too... Most of what you've gotten is a result of people caring for you and loving you and giving you. It's not just all done on your own. I mean, you weren't just left out in the conditions every day you were born. Someone cared for you. That's why you're here. You wouldn't be here otherwise because no one can just survive on their own. Everyone needs someone to care for them. You're the beneficiary of receiving. Now, whatever you received, it may not be the same as what someone else received. But you know what? Whatever you have is more than you started with. And when you think about it, whatever you have isn't going with you. Amen. So who cares? Why do you want to spin your wheels so much and set your affections on all these things? It's like it's, it's going to be gone if it's not tomorrow. It's in a day. It's in a year. It's in a month. It's in 10 years. Whatever. It just, it's going to be gone, though. Whatever the amount of time that is, gone. But if you have eternal life, wh wh who cares about this stuff then that's just a drop in the bucket? I mean, the Bible even says that our life is like a vapor that appeareth for a short time then vanisheth away. That's your life. However old you take, that's your whole life is like a vapor. How much less the things you possess, they come and go regularly. So who cares about that? Don't put your mind on those things. Verse 8, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Everyone in here is dressed, so you've got raiment. Okay, and, and I'm guessing that everyone in here has had food within the last 24 hours. Okay, unless someone's fasting, you don't have to tell me. I know you can just keep that to yourself and, and whatever. But um, seriously, be content. Be satisfied. We're going into this season that... There's going to be all these different distractions as to tell you why you need all these things that you don't have. Don't get caught up in that stuff. Don't worry about it. Do you, do you ask yourself this, do you really, do you really need it? And I'm just as guilty as anyone else. We've been going through the same thing. We've got stuff 
going on at, at our house and things that need to be fixed and repaired. And it's just kind of like, well, we need to get this done. We need to get that done. And I have to keep reminding myself, well, how much do we really need to? I mean, even my floors that are broken up, we could still walk on them. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, seriously, like, like, what's the purpose of the floor? Walk on it, right? Like, it, it still functions. It still works. You know, we've got a dwelling around us. And, and, and yeah, we're going to end up getting things fixed, but it's going to be in, you know, price that we could maintain. And, and this, I'm bringing this up. I hate bringing all my personal stuff up, but it's like, I, I just want to be relatable so that you can think about things in the right context of going, yeah, how much do I really need something? We always think we need, I need to have this vehicle and I need to have this phone and I need to have this. But do you really? Just challenge yourself on the things that you really think you need to have. Do you really need to have that? Because the Bible says something different. Having food and raiment, let's just be content with that. Let's be happy with that. It doesn't mean you can't have more, but when it talks about being happy with what you have, you check off the box, food and clothing. Okay, now you don't have a reason not to be happy, not to be content, not to be satisfied. Oh, I hate having this thing, and it's always it's a big piece of junk. It's a big tr piece of trash. I hate having this car with the paint peeled all off of it. Every, you know, like, look, don't have that wicked attitude. It's more than you had when you were born. <laughs> Didn't bring that into the world. We're not carrying it out, so be thankful for what we got, right? Be content. Verse 9, but, here's the contrast with those that are content, but they that will be rich, and will doesn't mean they're going to be, it means they want to be. Right? So we typically think of the word will as being like, oh, it's going to happen. No, will is, has to do with what you want, like your last will and testimony. It's, it's your desires. So they that have the desire, they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare. It doesn't say they might, it just says they do. They fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And yes, that is true. And no, it's not a root of all kinds of evil. It is the root of all evil. The King James Bible is right. It's the word of God. Don't be deceived by these other translations that want to change it into saying something different. Look, the love of money is the root of all evil. Words matter. If you weren't fully understanding the covetousness at the beginning of the sermon, I don't know why, like, well, I don't see what the big deal is. Well, 1 Timothy 6.10, memorize that verse. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You want to be a covetous person? You're going to have the fightings, you're going to be miserable. You're going to have many sorrows. It will never do you any good to always be wanting things you can't have. That's why. That's the why. God just commands us not to do it at all. Why does he command us? Because he cares about us. Because he knows what covetousness will do to a person. And he doesn't want you destroyed. And he doesn't want you miserable. He actually wants you living a good life, which is why he doesn't want you fornicating, which is why he doesn't want you committing adultery, which is why he doesn't want you lying and stealing and killing and coveting. Turn if you go to Luke chapter 12. We'll close with this. Luke chapter 12. This will be the most lengthy portion of Scripture we're going to read this morning, but it's, it's worth it. It kind of encapsulates the sermon. We're going to start reading in verse number 13 of Luke chapter number 12. The Bible reads, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So this is some guy that comes to Jesus and, and is just saying, Hey, can you, can you talk to my brother? 
because he's supposed to be dividing this inheritance to me. This, I, I, I'm owed this inheritance. And can you just talk to him? Because he's not splitting. Apparently, it seems like he's not splitting it with him, right? So he's asking Jesus, hey, can you just tell him he needs to split this with me? Right? And look, you could understand that. You'd be like, well, hey, I mean, Jesus is, is someone who's in authority. He's, he's viewing Jesus, calling him master. He's, he's looking at him as the Lord. But he's focused on, he's got this problem. And, and, and look, don't think too bad about this person without just considering yourself first, right? Now, look, this person is wrong, and Jesus is going to rebuke him. But it's easy to point out other people <laughs> where they're wrong. Like, oh, yeah, this guy, what was this guy thinking? What was he going to Jesus for that for? Well, okay, how about then apply that to yourself, right? You have an inheritance coming your way or something. It was in someone's will. You're supposed to get something, and, and you've got a family member that's not doing that. Right? Uh, what, you might have a rightful claim or whatever. And look, this is an area. I'm bringing this up specifically. <sighs> I cannot, it kind of is mind-blowing. This particular issue, how much it divides families. People who are supposed to love each other, brothers and sisters, cousins. I mean, one person dies and it's like everybody gets, turns mad and angry and is covered. I want to have this and I want to have that. And, I, you know, it's like, look, as a believer, we shouldn't be worried about that at all and we should value our relationships way more than you value money it is not worth losing the relationship with a with especially with a family member just over some stupid money well this is due to me why are you setting your heart so much on the money let it go and if someone's going to have that type of a covetous attitude, let them have that attitude. You don't need to fight against it. You don't need to right that wrong. You don't. You don't need to do it. I'm going to tell you, look, you could do whatever you want to do. You could say, no, I'm right on this. I'm going to keep doing this. Fine. You can let that consume you then because that's what's going to happen. You're going to get angry. You're going to ruin your relationships and be like, well, that's not right. I'm going to make sure he does. Okay. I'd rather just let God deal with it personally. But look what Jesus said to this man. He's seeking justice, going, hey, divide, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Brother saying like, why do you think this is even my job to just come here and settle your petty disputes with your brother? And he said unto them, verse 15, so he's going to use this example as an illustration for the whole group. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. This guy comes to him seeking this inheritance. I told him, he said, look, just beware. Watch out for covetousness. Watch out for wanting to have these things and desiring to have these riches and to be greedy over money. Watch out for that. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's not what life's about. It doesn't matter how much stuff you have. It doesn't matter. That's not what your life is about. The world, that is what life is about. I mean, I literally heard someone say, he who has the most toys wins. Like a man, a grown man. Not a six-year-old, right? That's a six-year-old mentality. Oh, I have more Nerf guns. Or I have more Legos than he does. I, you know, little kids think that way. Grown adult men should not be thinking that way. Oh, I've got a bigger house and I've got a bigger truck and I, you know, whatever, man. Okay, you win. Go ahead. You win. I concede. You're the winner. I'm the loser. It's fine. Because I don't believe that a man's life consists of the abundance of things that he possesses. Jesus is teaching to watch out for that. Don't worry about that. Don't get wrapped up into that. Too many family relationships are destroyed over covetousness. Who cares? Let it go. Verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. 
take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So here's a guy that has been blessed, right? It just says the ground brought forth abundantly. And that happens. That can happen to anyone. You can, you can be blessed in this world. You work, you get blessed. Hey, praise the Lord for that, right? That's great. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be setting your heart and your mind on all of that stuff. You shouldn't be. But it doesn't mean that you still can't be blessed in that way. We're just not out seeking for that, right? So this, this person, though, he's, he's looking at this and thinking, well, what am I going to do just because I have all this stuff? And when you have more than you can ever need or do anything with, why would you hoard it? And this is what this guy's thinking. He's like, well, what am I going to do? So I know what I'm going to do. Verse 18. This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Well, I'm just going to get a bigger bank. I'm going to get a bigger mattress to hide everything under. I'm going to just stockpile this stuff up. Right? And then I just won't do anything. I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. I'm just going to be lazy or whatever. Right? But God said unto him, thou fool. So uh, the world might say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Right? Lay up a ton of money and then go into retirement. So what it does this not sound like that to me? Make a bunch of money. Oh, wait. Wow, I have even more. Well, what am I going to do? I'll, I'll put more money over here. I'm going to pile this up. And then I'm just going to go on easy street. But God said unto him, thou fool. Hmm. Maybe we ought to rethink what the world is telling us we ought to do in our life, with our resources, with what God has blessed us with. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? All that stuff that you worked so hard for, that you got, that you built up, that you stored, that you kept, you're, you're gone. You're going to be gone tonight. You're not even going to get to enjoy all that stuff. Not, not, now who's going to get it? And, but this is the key, verse 21, because, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound too much like it's wrong to have money put away. Because I don't believe it's wrong to have money put away. I don't believe that, which is why we need to get the whole story because now we're going to get the full explanation. Verse 21 says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the person that didn't have any concern about the things of God at all. And all his life revolved around his own goods, his own finances. Well, I got this big nest egg. Okay, I'm all, I'm, I'm all secure. I'm all ready to go but he totally didn't have any concern for the things that really matter. And what the Bible's teaching here is that like all that stuff is nothing. I mean, it's just meaningless. So who cares? So why are you going to, you know, that's foolish. You should have been more concerned about your soul. You should have been more concerned about being rich toward God. You should have been more concerned about living that way instead of trying to save up for some years of your life to be able to just live easy. And for a believer, hey, if we, could, if we can do things to promote the kingdom of God, that's a much better use of your resources than just being able to sit on your rear end and, and do nothing. Right? Or if you're talking, and, and, and the, reason, the, the money thing, that's a whole other sermon. We can do that maybe another day. But um, the, the money doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of the, at the end of the day. Laying up treasure for yourself, not being rich toward God, that is foolish. Let's keep reading here, verse number 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Now, we already saw that if you have food and clothing, be content with that. And Jesus is even saying to his disciples, now look, life is more than just that. It's more than your food and clothing. Be, be content with what you have, but life isn't even about that. So he's saying don't even worry about that. Don't worry about your food and don't worry about your clothing. That's all you need to be content. 
But even that you don't have to worry about. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. Remember that other guy, he had this big storehouse and he had to save up and everything. He's saying, look at the rest of his God's creation. Look at the ravens. They don't have to sow, they don't have to reap, they don't have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? God, God provides for the birds. <laughs> right? I think you're a little bit better than a bird. The whole point is, just have faith and do what God wants you to do. He will, he will take care of you. But the Bible teaches not to be lazy and not to be slothful too, right? So like you can't just sit around and think that like, oh, well, I'm just going to have all this faith like a bird, right? And I'm going to just walk around from tree to tree or something and, and God's going to throw food in my lap. No, it's a little bit, a little bit more complicated than that. You, got, you do actually have to put forth work and you have to be seeking the things of God, which is going to require you to work. But it doesn't mean that, uh, but, but still, God will provide for you. But you got to be working. you got to be putting forth an effort. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 25. And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not... Ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of those things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then he says this, verse 33, Sell that ye have, and give alms. He's calling the guy that was stocking everything up a fool, but then he's saying here, well, hey, why don't you just sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. All the things of this world, thieves can take, other people can take, you could lose them, they could just go to nothing. But you know what? When you actually do something or give that away or, you know, are, are, are serving and giving of that, no, no one can take, no one can take what you don't have. And no one can also take then the reward that God is laying up for you in heaven. Because when you're actually doing good and doing righteousness, that will earn you rewards. And when you're being a servant, being a minister and being a help, God sees that and he will pay you for your service in heaven. But the key to all of this is verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I want you to walk away from this sermon with that in your heart. Where your treasure is, that will your heart be also. Well, if you're looking for that treasure this Christmas, I hope my husband, I hope my wife buys me this, I hope my mom, I hope my dad buys me this, and you've got your, that treasure. Well, that's where your heart is going to be, and it's going to be on that thing. And you know what? If it's on something, it's going to disappoint it's going to be empty. It's going to break. It's going to actually not really provide you the joy and the happiness that you want. But if your heart is on the things of God, if your heart is on just being righteousness, do, being righteous, doing righteousness, helping people out, that is where the true joy is going to come. Okay, that's where, um, you know, if that's your treasure, the things in heaven, your heart will be set the same way. But if, you're, if your treasure is here on earth, your heart's going to be on things of the earth. And we see what that does. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much uh, for your word and for the guidance and the instruction. And Lord, we all, we all need to, to hear this, I believe, this great truth about covetousness, especially at this time of year. I pray that you would please help us to avoid uh, the pitfalls of seeking after all of the, the things of this world and, and not get distracted with all of the things and, and to just be able to um, love the people in our life and, and, and be able to, yes, be able to give, but not get wrapped up in things. And, and Lord, help us to, um, to serve you better, to be content, especially with what we have, that we could look on the things that we have and not on the things that we don't have, dear Lord. I pray that you please bless the church, bless everyone here, Lord. Help us to, to really 
bring about the right spirit this time of year and, and throughout all of the year, dear Lord. Not one that is a spirit of covetousness, but one that's a spirit of love and a spirit of giving. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.